Abby, would you come and read our first passage? Today's first reading comes from Psalm 145, verses 17 through 21. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Thanks be to God for the reading of his holy word. Thank you, Abby. Well, as you could see from the bulletin cover this week, we're starting a series on prayer, and in particular, the Lord's Prayer. We're going to be unpacking that for the next couple months. Prayer is a, is a common thing. We do it here every Sunday. It's a part, regular part of Christian life. But I'm wondering, when I mention that, we're going to spend a couple months talking about prayer. How do you feel about that? Indifferent, maybe bored, maybe a twinge of guilt, like, oh, yeah. If I said, how's your prayer life? Would you wonder what on earth I'm talking about? Or would you feel like, oh, yeah, that, been meaning to get to it? Maybe you'd be confused. I'd like to pray, but I really don't understand it. Sometimes our discomfort with prayer or our posture towards prayer and attitude is a reflection of our thoughts and connection to God. The two are closely related, you know. We might feel a little bit uncomfortable approaching God. Maybe that's because God's Spirit has been poking us, prodding us, and convicting us about something. And so sitting down quietly in the presence of God feels a little intimidating, a little uncomfortable. So we distract ourselves instead. Or maybe it's hard to think about sitting down with God because you're a little angry. Angry at how things are going in this world, in your world. Wondering, uh, do I really want to talk to one who seems to be in control but not doing a good job of it? Do I want to do that? Maybe. You're wondering, well, I, I'm not even sure if there's a God at all. Or if there is a God, is he attentive? Does he listen? It's a futile exercise. Isn't prayer just a childish Sunday school exercise that we ought to outgrow when we get older? Isn't it more mature to just conform ourselves to the situations we find ourselves in and do the best we can to move forward? Well, you might be feeling all kinds of things about prayer. It might be on your list of something I ought to do. But all kind of emotions can push us away from prayer, from the intimacy of being still with God. And yet, I think you're probably like me in this way too. We do find ourselves praying. Sometimes just spontaneously. It just comes out. When something arises, I get a phone call in the middle of the night. My first thought is to run down. Do I know where all my kids are? <coughs> what are they doing? Did they tell me they were traveling? Are they going anywhere? And without my words moving, my heart lifts up a prayer, oh God, protect those ones I love the most. Right after my kids, I think of you all. What's happened in the congregation? What's going on? Oh God, your presence and peace, I'm asking for it. Sometimes you might get a text or call, learn about an accident or a serious illness of a loved one. Maybe something happens that suddenly disrupts your family's financial situation and you wonder how you're going to make it. You might even mutter, oh God, what will we do now? It's kind of a prayer. And perhaps it's reading the newspaper identifying the things we've even just talked about this morning with our corporate prayer, things that move your heart to compassion. And you think, oh, how can this be? Another tragedy, another senseless loss of life, 
in other communities upset so profoundly. God, please be merciful to those who are involved. Sometimes it's positive things that move us to prayer. (laughs) That pickup truck that doesn't seem to notice that you're there and swerves so quickly right in front of you. And fortunately, it didn't happen two seconds earlier when you were trying to adjust the lid on your coffee cup in your lap. (laughs) And you think, oh, God, thank you. That didn't happen two seconds earlier. Maybe we encounter something that we just can't quite understand something uncanny, something holy and awesome. Perhaps it's an encounter with gratitude or beauty or nature showing itself to you in a new way. And we turn and say, thanks, God. Thanks, God, for this beauty. We do pray it, it comes out. Anne Lamott, a Christian writer, some of you might be familiar with her books. I'd recommend all of them, actually. But she has a, a little one out on prayer, and it's uh, titled, Help, Thanks, and Wow, the Three Essential Prayers. <laughs> Help, Thanks, and Wow. And I, and I find in my life some of those things come out uh, of me. Thanks, and, you know, wow, and help. It seems that prayer is universal. Not everybody, all the time, but Universally, all people everywhere have some tradition of praying, corporately and privately. It's just there since written history. It's a part of human life. Sometimes it comes spontaneously. You know, in the email this week, I, I wrote about prayer as being something like eating or walking or talking. There's, it resonates with a capacity within us and a desire to exercise that, an appetite and also the uh, appropriate capacity or ability to do something like eating. We sense a hunger that we want to have filled. And we awake people when we're allowing ourselves not to be dulled or numbed by responsibilities or distractions. We know there is something about this human life that hungers for more like eating, we reach out for what is more that can fill us. Or like walking. We have these physical bodies with capabilities that want to be expressed, want to do things, we want to practice it and show our strength and confidence. Or like speaking. We have this innate desire to show ourselves, reveal ourselves with our words and for those words to be heard and received and connect with another. Well, and just like walking and eating and talking, we can do these things well and we can do them poorly. We know the habits that we engage in shape us. Sometimes it leads to greater health and skill and strength and connection and freedom. And sometimes those habits lead us in the other direction keep us restrained or disconnected and work against our flourishing. And the same is true with prayer. It can arise spontaneously and yet we can work at praying well. That's what the disciples wanted. They wanted to learn how to pray. You know, they had seen Jesus praying in different contexts. All kinds of things. We can think about him praying uh, over f- folks who were ill and them being healed, healed. We think of him praying aloud before the crowd gathered outside Lazarus' tomb. And he says, Father, you know what I desire. But I'm saying this so that those gathered here will know that you hear and listen. And he calls Lazarus forth. They know that Jesus has a habit of getting up early, quite often in sneaking off by himself to a quiet place to spend time in prayer. You know, the the prayer we're going to talk about is called the Lord's Prayer, but it's not so much a prayer that he prayed. We have lots of prayers. Well, we have lots of indication that Jesus prayed, and we have one long prayer in John chapter 17 where Jesus prays for his disciples. But this is a prayer that he gives us, gives it to us. 
Now, the disciples, they were not unfamiliar with prayer. They'd grown up with it. They had different levels of engagement with their Jewish tradition, but all of them would have known prayer as a regular part of their life, morning and evening, perhaps noon, or with meals, depending on how tightly they walked with the tradition. They may have little uh, blessings that they said uh, through every activity as they were getting dressed or washing themselves or picking up the instruments of their work. They would have known prayer. They would have been familiar with it. And yet, they want to learn. So we read here in Luke chapter 11. This is one of the formulations of the Lord's Prayer. It says this, One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just like John taught his disciples. <laughs> they felt like they were missing out on something. You've got this thing going, Jesus, this habit, this discipline, this practice, and we want to learn to do it. And after all, your cousin John, he's teaching his disciples, teach us. We don't want to be left behind. And so Jesus says to them in Luke 11, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us and do not lead us into temptation. <laughs> There's another formulation of this prayer, the one we're more familiar with. It comes from Matthew's Sermon on the Mount in chapter 6 of Matthew's Gospel. It's very familiar. Jesus says this, When you pray, then this is how. Say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now the great uh, Christian tradition that was captured in the very first century, a little document called the Didache, the teaching of the apostles, has this and it adds a little epitaph that we use. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That's not in the Gospels, but it certainly is resonant with Jesus' teaching and an appropriate end to that. So familiar to us, isn't it? It's a classic, something we can keep learning from, but also because things that are so familiar, they kind of become worn out sometimes. They lose their meaning. We're not sure what they are. Maybe you engage in it in a way that doesn't fully engage us. In the very first step of our prayer life, we see modeled by the disciples, and it's a desire to want to learn. Teach us to pray. It's where it starts. You know, prayer really is the lifeblood of the spiritual life. It's like oxygen our relationship with God. We can think of it as the connective tissue that keeps us bound to the vine. You remember the series on the fruit of the Spirit, connecting, abiding in the vine. Well, prayer is like the back and forth flow of nutrients from the vine to another. In many ways, prayer is no more than conversation with God, speaking and listening. Sometimes it's formal, like we do here in gathered situations. Sometimes it's corporate, like this. Sometimes it's individual, and sometimes it's very informal. You know. And as I've already said, we bring intellectual obstacles and emotional baggage with us each time we pray. And God knows that. God knows that. He knows it right where we are. And still the invitation comes. There's this beautiful passage in Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 8. And then it's an acknowledgement of sometimes not knowing how to pray. And that can be for all kinds of reasons. And the passage doesn't identify it. But let me, let me read to you from Romans 8. It says this. We know that the whole of creation has been groaning as if in childbirth pains right up to the present moment. And not only creation around us, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we also, we groan inwardly as we wait for our full adoption as sonship and the redemption of our bodies. 
And that's the hope that we've been saved for. But hope that is seen isn't really hope at all. For who hopes for what they already got? Paul's saying, you're still wanting what you don't fully have. Or, or as Bono would say, I still haven't found what I'm looking for fully. He says, we still want that. But if we hope, we still wait patiently. And he says this, and in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we don't know how we ought to pray. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he searches our hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people and in accordance with the will of God. The Spirit itself works in us, sometimes no more articulate than a groan. Oh, you know. Sometimes we can sigh in rebellion, can't we? Oh, God, not again. Do I have to put up with more of this? Sometimes we sigh because we just seem overwhelmed with the trouble around us. Oh, God, not more of this. And the Spirit groans within us. It knows our heart, prods our heart, and intercedes for God's people. <clears throat> you know, uh, before Jesus answered that question, the, gave the formula about praying the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, he gave some instructions about how to pray. With the Lord's Prayer, he's just saying the what. Say this. But he gave some instruction about how, and he did it in the negative seen in, in uh, that Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. Jesus says, listen, when you pray, don't be like those hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogue or on street corners to, see, to be seen by other people. And I tell you, they've already received their reward in full. They've got what they were looking for. They wanted public attention. They wanted kudos. They wanted others to notice them as somehow a spiritual person. But Jesus says, but when you pray, go to your room, close the door, and pray to our Father who is unseen, and then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He goes on, says this, and when you pray, don't keep babbling on like the pagans. They think that somehow they'll be heard because of their many words, but don't leave, be like them. Your Father knows what you need even before you ask. He's saying, don't be like hypocrites. Don't be like pagans. Don't, don't uh, do your prayers in a way that <coughs> your audience really is intended some, for somebody else to see you and have an impression of who you are. And don't think somehow that you can earn God's attention by speaking over and over the same kind of things. You know, let me just say one word about hypocrisy. Sometimes we get confused about hypocrisy and say things like this. Well, why would I pray to God when I don't feel like it? You know? Hypocrisy is saying you believe one thing in public or to a certain audience, but acting out of accord with that. It's about belief and behavior. It's not so much about feelings. How many of you who are married have, can say this? I feel like loving my spouse every moment of the day. No, you, you probably don't. And yet, you can act lovingly towards your spouse even when you don't feel like it. That's not hypocrisy. That's faithfulness. That's fidelity. That's diligence, that's discipleship. So we don't have to feel like praying to pray with integrity. It's not about feeling. That's not the hypocrisy that Jesus is talking about. You know. But the very first step of learning to pray is wanting to pray. Being like that request from the disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Reminds me of a story I was told about a, uh, a little kid in India. He's sitting uh, on the banks of the Ganges near a, an old guy with gray hair and lots of whiskers. And he thinks, there's a spiritual man. And he asked him, he said, hey, will you teach me to pray? The old man says, sure. And he grabs a kid by the collar, and he dunks him down under the water, and he holds him there. 
until he starts struggling and bubbles are coming up. And he, can, and he waits may, maybe just a little longer than he should. Then he pulls the kid up. And he says, what was, what was that about? I just wanted you to teach me to pray. He says, yeah. Well, here's my first lesson. When you long for God the same way you long for a breath, then you're on your way to learning to pray. Henry Nouwen said this about prayer, that praying is no easy thing. It demands a relationship in which you allow the other to enter into the very center of your person and to speak there and to touch the sensitive core of your being to allow that other to see you so much that you would rather slink off in the darkness. It's talking about vulnerability, inviting God into every corner of our hearts, even the most sensitive ones. It takes some courage to do that. It's clear that one doesn't pray. And this is an, another theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, from the 1400s that who, far from lifting himself up to God, rather requires that God should lower himself to him, who resorts to prayer not to stir up their own heart to will what God's will, but rather in an effort to persuade God to will what he wills. <laughs> He's saying this, when we enter into prayer, the primary objective isn't to persuade the creator of the universe, to adopt our puny little will and desires, but rather to allow ourselves to be caught up into his will. And Kier Kierkegaard, one of my favorite theologians uh, from the 1700s, Danish guy, he said it more simply. He said, the function of prayer is not to influence God, but rather to change the nature of the one who prays. And that requires vulnerability. The desire to learn to pray well goes hand in hand with a desire to not remain who you are, to allow yourself to be changed. Well, this, this prayer, this Lord's Prayer that we're going to be talking about, you know, so many of Jesus' teachings are kind of elusive and illustrative and uh, evocative in a way. Somebody asks him a question and he'll ask a question back. He'll, they'll ask a real earnest question and he'll tell them a story that leaves half of the crowd scratching their head. But when it comes to this, it is simple and clear and direct. Anybody can learn it. It's simple. You know, this, this prayer too, from the very beginning of the church has been used. When we use it on a Sunday morning, we're reaching back over 2,020 years, carrying on a tradition that others who have followed Jesus have used. That's, that's pretty amazing. You know, um, there's in, in this prayer, the power of it is disproportional to its simplicity. I think it's reverse proportions. That it's so simple, and yet its power is so straight. Uh, Augustine said this about the Lord's Prayer. If we pray as we ought, then no matter what else we say, our words will say nothing that is not already included in the Lord's Prayer. And anyone who says something that is not fitting to the Lord's Prayer, well, then they're just issuing forth an empty prayer. And somehow the Lord's Prayer it captures everything in there. And Aquinas, again, he, he agrees with this. He says the Lord's Prayer not only ask for those things that ought to be desired, but also puts them in the proper order. It orders our affections in the right direction. Starts off with eyes focused on God. Almost always, I confess, my prayers start off with a mindfulness of my need, my desires. Well, those are real things, and God knows that those are real needs and real desires, and they fit within the Lord's Prayer, but they're not the first point. The first point is an acknowledgement of the one that we pray to, who it is that we pray to. Just one more theologian here is Martin Luther, much closer to our time, just about 400 years ago. He says, as it's often been said, however, this is certainly the very best prayer that has ever come to earth, 
or that anyone would ever have thought up because God the Father composed it through his son and he placed it in his mouth there for us, no doubt. It must please him immensely. <laughs> and that's something to think that we get to pray God's own words back to God. As Luther says, this is the very best one. And yet I'll confess, and I bet you can relate to me, sometimes it seems like just an old worn out shoe, so familiar, right? Well, hopefully as we spend time with this over the next uh, months, we can press into it, unpack it more fully so that we can engage it more deeply not for the sake of being great prayers, but for the sake of having a closer walk with the God who taught us this way to pray. And I think it's true that if this is the only thing we had, the only guide we had to faith, the only instruction in spiritual life and formation, but we used it thoroughly and mindfully and intentionally, it would bring about the effective transformation of our own hearts and wills. And that's what Christ invites us to do. That is, after all, what this whole exercise of doing church is about. It's about our stepping forward further on the path of following Jesus towards our own transformation from the inside out. It is kind of a, a foolproof guide. It will keep us on track, help us know what we ought to to want and how to pray for it. Uh, and it will deepen our relationship, no matter where you are in your relationship with God, whether it's anger, disinterest, doubt, distrust, confusion, or longing. Entering more deeply into this prayer, allowing it to order your affections and direct your thoughts will lead you more deeply to relationship with God. I just I want to just close with this. Why can we hope for this? As we more intentionally adopt a posture of students, disciples, and say, Lord, teach us to pray, <coughs> here's a, just a word about the hope that it will bear fruit in our life. It comes through Andrew Murray. He's a Scottish guy born in South Africa, educated at Edinburgh, then back the rest of his whole life in South Africa. But he writes this. Amid the painful consciousness of our own ignorance and unworthiness, in the struggle between our believing and our doubting, the heavenly art of effectual prayer is learned right where we are. Because even if we don't remember it, there is one, the beginner and the finisher of our faith, and of our prayer, who watches over our praying and sees to it that all those who trust in him, their education in the school of prayer will be carried on to perfection. But let the deep undertone of all our prayer be this, a teachableness that comes from faith in him who is the perfect teacher. And we may be sure that we shall be taught and we shall learn to pray in power. And yes, we can depend on it. He will teach us to pray. Well, with that hope and that assurance, I invite you with me over the next uh, few weeks, months of this autumn, to enter more deeply, not just in what we talk about here, but in your own life at home, driving, in the car or when you get up in the morning or when things have really ticked you off. Let that be a reminder and a prod. Or when you're feeling discouraged or dejected or even just bored, may the Spirit prompt you to say, time to pray. We're going to use a, a hymn, a familiar little chorus called Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. We're going to use it for the next uh, several weeks in part because it it uh, helps order with the words that fill our mouths and hopefully pull our hearts along with it. This truth to seek God's kingdom first. And we can be assured that those who seek will find. Those who ask Christ to teach them to pray will be taught. 
Let's stand and sing together. It's number 349. Seek ye first the kingdom of God.